Good day. Uh, what a great pleasure it is to be able to MC our 116th month in a row of our TMIT National Research Testbed webinars. Uh, the title today is Healthcare Professional Burnout, a Critical Caregiver and Patient Safety Issue. Uh, and uh, I am, we really, really feel blessed to have this uh, great set of speakers today. Uh, I'm Charles Denham. I'm going to be the MC today uh, of the program and the chairman of TMIT. A couple of uh, uh, housekeeping details. Please make sure that your WebEx volume is up to the max, as well as your computer volume and your external speaker volume. I'm on the third slide for those that have slides. On the fourth slide, if you do not have good audio, please click on participants and click on the request phone button to get a, a toll dial-in number, and then you can get uh, you may be able to get a, a better audio recording. On slide five is the how to go back to listen to the presentation and view it. Uh, in the future for enduring content, and for those of you that are on the enduring content, this is how we uh, can go back to also uh, download resources. For those that don't have slides right now, go to www.safetyleaders, all one word, dot, uh, org, and you'll be able to uh, download uh, the slides. And what will the way to get to them is in the upper right-hand quadrant of the landing page. If you click on upcoming events. You can click on this webinar, and uh, you'll be able to uh, then get the slides and download them. They'll take you to a page that I now have for those that are viewing, uh, which is uh, uh, slide six, and it has Dr. Swinson and Nancy Conrad's uh, images there, and we'll be adding, adding additional resources as we uh, proceed. So that's how to get the slides. Uh, we have a Twitter, Facebook, and social media uh, accounts that are described on slide seven. On slide eight is our purpose statement, and our purpose is we will measure our success by how we protect and enrich the lives of families, patients, and caregivers. And this is particularly important for today's presentation uh, from Dr. Swenson and the, pa the patient safety Pete Conrad Global Patient Safety Awards, one of our award winner, winners is, uh, is uh, focused on uh, the health and care of the caregivers after adverse events. So uh, this is pertinent to today for today's presentation for sure. Our mission is to accelerate performance solutions that save lives, save money, and create value in the communities that we serve. I won't dwell on it, but there are no products or services uh, described or referenced in the presentation, and the disclosure statement is on slide nine. Uh, we have a wonderful group of speakers and reactors today. Our lead speaker is Dr. Uh, Steve Swenson, uh, who has been a terrific leader at the Mayo Clinic and has, and, and through his retirement, I think, even taken on more work and is one of our global leaders in this area of burnout and working with a number of uh, wonderful organizations. Nancy Conrad is on a flight today, but she'll be presenting the 2018 Pete Conrad Patient Safety Award winners, of which Steve Swenson is one. Uh, uh, we have uh, Arlene Salamandra and Jennifer Dingman, uh, who also are winners, and our patient advocates, as well as Dan Ford, who uh, will be, has a recorded message. And then we have uh, uh, Chief Bill Adcox from the MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center and Dr. Gregory Boats from uh, MD Anderson, also an adjunct faculty at Stanford, uh, and uh, both of them are uh, award winners today and will also be reacting to uh, Dr. Swenson's presentation. And so we'll have the voice of the patient today live with our lean Salamandra, and we'll also have uh, a message from Jennifer Dingman in the enduring content. Arlene, would you help us set our compass heading today to our true north? Hi, I, I just I would like to welcome everyone for being on the webinar today. Uh, I'm looking forward to the presentation of Dr. Swenson, uh, the burnout, uh, healthcare professional burnout. Um, I, as a caregiver myself, I worked 11 years in a senior care center um, with healthcare patients to assisted living. And I, and I know some of the challenges that um, frontline workers do have. So I'm really looking forward to that presentation and uh, also to Nancy Conrad and all the good work she's doing uh, by recognizing people that are out there fighting for the safety of patients. So I really want to give her a big thanks and uh, can't tell her enough how much we appreciate it. So back to you. Thank you. Thank, 
Thank you, Arlene. And we'll have a little bit more of a, a bio for Arlene because she was one of our former Pete Conrad Global Patient Safety winners for great work that uh, she has contributed to, a published author, a national advocate, and as she has said, uh, uh, a uh, patient safety uh, advocate, especially in the area of uh, workplace violence and bu uh, bullying and has also been a co-author of multiple uh, papers and a contributor to the National Quality Forum State Practices. So my job now is to very rapidly go through the news update and the survey results of our research uh, for, with you uh, last, um, uh, last month. We covered workplace violence, uh, a critical patient safety and caregiver issue, and I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, however, we uh, have just an incredible amount of information that continues to flow regarding the issues of opioid uh, overdose and the opioid crisis. And so if you're working on projects there, the, the, uh, the, uh, the DEA's report on the dramatic increase of the synthetic uh, opioids, and perhaps Dr. Boats can mention that when uh, we're in our reactor session, and uh, the incredible rise in 2016 uh, of these. So we really want to make sure that everybody is cognizant of the latest data. If you have a, a, an opioid program, if you're working on this as a patient safety issue, we've covered it on a number of uh, webinars in the last 24 months. Uh, but this in dra dramatic increase in the synthetic opioids poses a real danger to caregivers, and we've included that in the MedTAC program. Also, congressional investigations are being undertaken into the distribution practices. And again, these slides are there for you. Uh, 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 you know, just so that you know that these latest things have been popping up over the last month since we had our last webinar. Last month, we addressed workplace violence uh, and specifically a message regarding emergency uh, room nurses. Uh, and we had uh, Chief Adcox and Vicki King both speak to this on the four P's of prevention, preparedness, protection, and performance improvement. Um, and uh, we kind of led off with the day, almost the day of the the, uh, the webinar, not only is this happening in healthcare, which is four times more frequent than in other industry sectors, we're also seeing that we also are seeing this on airline flights. So their question was uh, to the audience after hearing about workplace violence, uh, are you interested in additional information? We got a whopping 67% uh, of our uh, of our audience gave uh, gave this uh, uh, a, a 10. And so we can tell you for sure, we will be coming back with more on workplace violence. Uh, and I'm certain that Dr. Swenson may have some, some comments regarding how burnout can contribute uh, to those internally. Um, and the, the subject matter or that you want is on, are on slide 20, which I won't read, but we want to make sure that on both slides 20 and 21, the issues that you brought up will be addressed in the upcoming uh, program that will continue to focus on the workplace violence issue and healthcare. And this is both internal and external. This is peer-to-peer -peer as well as patient uh, to, uh, to staff. Uh, we asked the court in a webinar uh, with an update on uh, the action plans after an adverse event. Again, 51% gave it a 10, 93% agreed, 78% uh, strongly or very strongly agreed. So we will follow up with uh, 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 an uh, organized webinar uh, on what the latest is on the after, uh, the after action and the action plans after an adverse event. Slide 23, I won't read, but it has the detail uh, for you. Uh, part of that is also, and uh, in August we'll have one, our speaker in August will be Cynthia Shapiro, who will speak briefly regarding the weaponization of HR after an accident, uh, the tendency for organizations to not look at their own systems, but then look at their people, make them a bad apple, and not look at the barrel. So uh, that'll be one of the topics for uh, our August uh, webinar. We ask you, are you interested in best HR practices after an adverse event that specifically addresses this? 49% uh, of you gave it a 10, 16% gave it a 9. Clearly, uh, this is uh, an indication. However, there's more of a spread into the neutral and even uh, negative to neutral. However, there's enough evidence there for us uh, to be able to uh, address this as a future webinar, which we will. And on slide 26, which I won't read for you, it addresses the topics that you'd like to have, and we'll make sure our speakers address that. We wanted to remind you that we're participating in a project that is pioneered on or, or built off of the principles of the uh, Innocence Project that used DNA 
to actually uh, help uh, help define the ins the innocence of people that had uh, been un un uh, uh, unfairly treated or unjustly treated, and uh, this project will use the electronic record, which is the new technology like DNA was, to focus on that. And we'll be inviting David Marks and others in Just Culture to uh, help us with that. So. That brings us to uh, the introduction. I'm right on time, 10 minutes after the hour, to really set up Dr. Swenson. And what we regularly do are perform literature searches and try to find uh, content that will uh, help be a complement uh, to, uh, to the information that our speakers are providing. And uh, so this Stanford Medicine uh, publication uh, uh, addresses uh, uh, burnout and the, the connection to unsafe surroundings. We know that Dr. Swenson will be covering this. We just want you to be aware of what's in the literature there and uh, uh, some of the factoids and facts that were expressed uh, in this study. And I know, Steve, you're producing a, a, a book this next year that will probably be the definitive work in this area. So uh, I'm certain that you have probably much better data or data that complements this 54% of doctors say they're burned out, 88% are moderately to severely stressed, and the 59% wouldn't recommend a career in medicine to their children, which is such a shame because it's such a, a fabulous career. Um, uh, this uh, issue of it, uh, the they used the topic of uh, uh, and ad addressed it as a national epidemic, which I know Steve will cover. The Mayo Proceedings uh, article uh, uh, here, I know Steve will address this probably as well. And, um, uh, and then today, because we always want to be as timely as we can for you, knowing that a number of you use our content to brief your teams today in Forbes, Physicians are human to uh, an article, and you can pull it right off of Forbes uh, that addresses uh, this issue. And actually, the linkage to suicide, which Steve, perhaps you can kind of mention uh, that physicians in the United States have the highest suicide rate of any profession and twice that of the general population at 28 to 40 per 100,000. And uh, the, you know, how the bur burnout uh, 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 ties into this uh, terrible, uh, uh, terrible issue. So Steve Swenson is uh, our speaker today, a dear friend, a fabulous uh, physician who has had a terrific background. And uh, you know he's, he's uh, dedicated to the development of thoughtful, thoughtful leaders and teams. He is publishing a terrific book on the topic that he's covering uh, today. He serves as the medical director for professionalism and peer support at Intermountain Healthcare. He's a senior fellow at the IHI, and he co-leads the Joy and Work Initiative, and he works as the theme leader and member of the New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst Board. Um, we've known Steve for a very long time, and he, most recently he was the director for leadership and organizational development and co-led the professional burnout work. He oversaw a development of 4,100 physicians and scientists and 232 key leaders. Um, we worked with Steve back when he was the director for quality, and he established the Quality Academy and Value Creation System. He's worked on a number of projects with other national and global leaders. Uh, he's in the, uh, uh, the Discovery Films. Uh, we had the honor of helping produce, uh, at, along with WHO, and worked on a number of national quality forum issues, including the five rights of uh, imaging. Uh, and then while the chair of uh, the Department of Radiology, his leadership team, used Six Sigma and Baldrige to create value for patients uh, um, through a staff of 1,200 people in that division, and they perform more than 1 million exams annually. So, uh, Steve, uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. And because of the great work that uh, you had undertaken, the, the Pete Conrad uh, Award, which I'll address a little bit later, you're one of, the, one of the winners of this award in patient safety. And so we're so honored that you'll speak today when we announce the winners after you give your great talk. So, Steve, take it away. Chuck, thank you so much. This is a w wonderful honor to be part of this patient-centered, high-performer webinar, and it's particularly an honor to be um, on a program with Dr. Denham, who is a wonderful role model servant leader and a longtime friend of mine. Today, we'd like to talk about um, moving from this national epidemic of burnout to esprit de corps. And we'd like to focus on the more aspirational, positive esprit de corps 
than trying to get rid of something bad like burnout. Esprit de corps is camaraderie, engagement, fulfillment, infused with just the right amount of passion, loyalty, and yes, joy. Esprit de corps is the antipode of burnout. And if you look at the opportunity to improve the care of patients and their families, I don't believe there is a more impactful and important leading indicator over which we have control than esprit de corps. It's the most important leading indicator of patient experience, patient outcomes, patient safety, as well as organizational effectiveness. Esprit de corps is taking care of each other for our patients. This is Marine Bizignano. She is a media past president of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, a wonderful uh, woman. She's a past nurse, and she's taught me thousands of things, including you cannot give what you don't have. She had me lead a large group of 50 um, international leaders who came together from a large system in Europe. And the leader of this hospital system told the story to these 50 leaders um, about her son, who had glomerular lymphitis, eventually needed a kidney transplant in one of her own hospitals. And even though there weren't any medical errors and the kidney worked well, she described her experience and her family's experience like this. These eight words, she said, there was no love in the system. There was no love in the system that she led, and her expectations were missed. And, and so it comes back to what Maureen says. You cannot give what you do not have, and if you do not have love and empathy for the people that you're caring, uh, then care will be different results. In fact, research shows that patients who don't feel loved in their relationship with their professional healthcare professional team, their surgical wounds heal slower. It's amazing. So caring for each other for our patients gets back to if patients designed healthcare. They would ask us to start with asking them what matters to them, not what's the matter, but what matters to them, and then doing our three jobs, to do our work, to improve our work, and the third wish is for us to care for each other because they understand patients and families whom we have the privilege of serving that if we don't take care of ourselves, their care will not be as good as it should be. Professional burnout is a very serious issue in America and developed countries. Approximately half of physicians and nurses are burned out, which means they have no love left. They're emotionally exhausted, they're socially isolated, they're cynical, and they are de they experience depersonalization, which is a fancy word for saying that nurses and doctors who are burned out interact with patients as objects, not as people. If you are burned out, you are more likely to commit medical errors. Physicians who are burned out have twice the rate of medical errors as non-burned out physicians. If you are a patient on an ICU, where there is a measurable level of nurse burnout, there is a significantly higher mortality rate of patients who are cared for by nurses who are burned out. You're more likely to commit suicide. You're more likely to leave your job. Your productivity goes down. Your teamwork goes down. And it's a scary thing because the psychologists that study this tell us that it is contagious. Just like positive emotions on team are contagious, so is burnout. 
And so it's extraordinarily important for our patients that we get in front of this for our caregivers. There are many, many causes of professional burnout from work-life integration, from loss of control, to loss of meaning and purpose, to compassion fatigue, to from social isolation in and of itself can be a, uh, a root cause of burnout, as well as hostile work environments and uh, cognitive dissonance, where we're asked to do something that doesn't fit with our moral code. There are dozens of causes of professional burnout, and the way to understand them is to talk to the providers closest to the patient and ask them, like we should ask patients, what matters to you. Go back to Dr. Edwards Deming, one of the key leaders of quality in the last century. He taught us that bad process beats great people all the time. Bad process always beats great people. And so one of, if you look at all of those numerous causes of professional burnout, so many of them start with bad process, which is poor quality. And that gets us in this vicious cycle where we are in most of American healthcare that starts with the poor quality of overuse and defects and underuse that in and of itself increases the workload for healthcare professionals, that increased workload and decreased uh, work-life integration, creates more social isolation, the defects of care that aren't, that, that reach patients, um, cause needless compassion fatigue, the practice inefficiency results from 20th century processes that we're trying to address with 21st century technology, and the inefficiencies can be addressed, but they aren't being addressed at the rate they should be. The cognitive dissonance where we are doing care and delivering care without the same quality or the same um, values or the same amount of care that we would want for our own families creates this moral distress, and all of that leads to an erosion of meaning and more burnout. More burnout leads to more costs, poor quality leads to, and you have this vicious cycle. And so the way to break this vicious cycle is to look at it a different way. Einstein taught us that the world as we have created it is a process of our thinking. And he went on to say that if we are going to change the world, we need to change our thinking. So I go back to Professor Lasada, and he has studied high-performing teams for decades, and he's looked at the ratio of positivity to negativity on high-performing teams. And to, have, to be a team that's functional, that works well for patients, you need at least a 2.9013 positivity to negativity ratio. The ideal is six to one. And so basically, using that Lasada ratio, we would say, how can we, for doctors and nurses and social workers and pharmacists, all of the healthcare professionals closest to patients, how can we increase the positivity and decrease the negativity? I will only have time to share with you a few thoughts on two of these 10 validated evidence-based actions, but all of them increase the positivity and decrease the negativity of healthcare professional teams taking care of patients. And we'll start with co-creating quality. So co-creating quality uses Lasada's ratio to increase the positivity and decrease the negativity of teams. So I'll tell you a story about Dr. Martha Lacey. She chairs hematology at the Mayo Clinic. When she took over as chair, I was heading up uh, our leadership development program and co-leading with, with Dr. Shanafelt our professional burnout work, and this is close to a decade ago that this started. Um, hematology at that point had among the 10 highest rates of burnout of any department and division 
of all of the 64,000 people at Mayo Clinic. And so the, the first thing I want to say is that within two years, Dr. Lacey and her triad team of the nurse leader and administrator flipped those numbers from the highest rates to among the lowest rates at Mayo Clinic. So we know that we can change these numbers. We're not stuck and helpless and, and victims. We can be champions and flip these numbers. And what Martha Lacey and her uh, nursing and administrative partners did is they talked to everyone in Harvard Green College and said, what brings you joy at work? And what saps that joy at work? And what are the pebbles in your shoes? What doesn't work well here? And let's communicate those issues that we can't control to the organization, take a deep breath and forget about them, and focus on all of the issues that we can control within hematology. And so one at a time, they took pebbles out of shoes. And two years later, their burnout rates had shrunk to well below national averages. Now, one of the examples was that the nurses who had the highest rate of any professional in their hematology area, um, they, were get, they were getting phone calls all day long. And, and what they wanted to do was be with patients and touching them and helping them. And these phone calls were from poor quality in the first time around. So all patients and families were calling back with all these questions that should have been answered when they were in Rochester, Minnesota. And so they took notes, they took all, edited all those phone conversations, and every time there was a question that could have been answered when the patient and family were in town, they changed their process, and the phone call vanished, and the burnout went away. It's simple things like that that are account for much of the opportunities to improve the esprit de corps, the spirit of the body. And so instead of this vicious cycle, we move to a virtuous cycle with the co-creation of quality, with people doing the real work closest to the patient, looking for processes and workflow and defects of care, and addressing them with simple quality improvement work it helps to develop leaders. It builds camaraderie and meaning and trust among the team itself, and it drives out waste, variation, and defect in the care of patients. And of course, the reason we do this is to build the esprit de corps because we know that that will improve patient experience, outcomes, and safety. So patient experience, outcomes, and safety go in the right direction because there's less waste, variation, defect in the processes of care and because the caregivers are in a much better place emotionally and make fewer medical errors, patients have a better experience, there is love back in the system. Now, the reason to do this, of course, is for patient experience, outcomes, and safety. Um, but we also know that there is a financial return and a business case for all four of these endpoints, esprit de corps, better leaders, less waste, variation, defect, and better patient experience, outcomes, and safety, all have a validated business case that in and of themselves would be worth the whole effort, even though the primary focus, the sole focus is on the patient experience, all and safety, but there are dividends that go beyond that. That's the beauty of this virtuous cycle. And so no stories without da data and no data without stories. Uh, we published his work uh, a few years ago. Um, this is the first 217 clinical units like hematology that we worked with at Mayo. And now we've validated this in community hospitals, in hospitals in England, Scotland, and Sweden. Uh, we know that having caregivers, healthcare professionals, co-create quality over things that they can control in a work unit improves morale, improves burnout, improves teamwork. And so we know this works, and it's a good way to move forward. This is a good friend of mine, Roger Visar. He's a he's a now retired, but he was a pulmonary intensivist in uh, in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And uh, he shared this picture with me. He says, Steve, you can share this with anyone you like as long as you tell them that I didn't drink the whole thing. So Roger taught me a lot of things, including that co-creating quality with 
healthcare professionals on teams in a patient-centered way is a gateway drug for fulfillment. And we know that's the case from our experience. And once people start doing it, this is not just an event, it's not a project, it's not an initiative. This is the way we lead going forward, where we are asking and co-creating um, quality for our patients. Uh, and it's one of the 10 fundamentals for improving esprit de corps and eradicating burnout. One of the projects that Roger helped us with in a collaborative, uh, actually a couple of decades now, when I was first learning quality and first learning how internal collaboratives worked, and Roger would drive from Eau Claire to Rochester, get up at four in the morning, drive for two hours for our seven and a half meetings twice a month for the year. He did that for no pay, for no, he just did it because uh, he was trying to help us out. Uh, one of the projects was looking at the patient experience through CT and MRI and their flow and uh, all the uh, missed opportunities to improve their experience and, and, uh, and the outcomes. And um, we found in that project that Roger helped us with that we could double the throughput of our CT scanners with a very simple approach. Double the throughput overnight. And then, of course, once we figured out the basics of that, we knew that we could scale this to a way that now our psychiatrists are saying, we think we can double bill here for group therapy. Part of the secret is toes out instead of toes in. So the whole quality thing, we have to be careful about. Standardization in and of itself is not a virtue. We should seek to standardize and uh, improve processes only if it creates value for patients and creates time and trust and camaraderie for healthcare professionals. That's a litmus test. If we go in and tell doctors and nurses and social workers and pharmacists and MPs and PAs that we're doing standardization just to make more money, um, that's not the right approach. The right approach is to take this co-creation of quality that we do with healthcare professionals, and if there's a value in having the same bathtub that creates value for patients or creates time or trust or camaraderie for healthcare professionals, then do it. But if not, then let's move on to another opportunity to improve value for and create value for patients. I'm always reminded of the sign that Dr. Don Berwick, the founder of IHI, had on his desk for years, it was a question. How does this help the patient? If it doesn't help the patient or doesn't have a prospect of help the patient, then we need to redirect our efforts to bring back joy in the work so we have better results for patients. So this is basically the, 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 the five dividends of co-creating quality. You build trust between leaders and staff, you improve the reliability of patients. You, you grow better leaders for a healthier organization. Yeah, there are financial dividends, and we should understand that. That shouldn't be the primary motivation. And, of course, we build a esprit de corps, engagement, fulfillment, satisfaction, passion, loyalty, and joy. All of this gives us better results for patients. Then briefly, I want to share one more of these 10 validated actions, and, and that's the leader selection and development. If we all know that if leaders don't interact in a very positive way with staff, that sometimes we can feel like this. So we need to select and develop leaders who are uh, thoughtful and patient-centered. And I, I, I always like sharing this study that Nick Seibert did and published a few years ago in the Harvard Business Review. What he did, he had a micrometer, he measured the signature size of Fortune 500 presidents and CEOs on their annual report to shareholders. And he looked for a relationship between the size of the signature and the success of the company. And guess what? There was a relationship. The bigger the signature of the president and CEO of these Fortune 500 companies, the more likely the company budgets were to be overspent, market share decreasing, and narrower margins. So the key to success for selecting and developing leaders is to 
find doctors with small signature sizes? Well, in fact, at Mayo, we measured the signature size metaphorically. When I was leadership development director, we had, uh, uh, had 4,100 physicians, 242 were in formal title positions. We published this work on a 60-point scale. For every point upward, there was a 9% improvement in the satisfaction, in the esprit de corps of the staff that that leader uh, had the privilege of, of leading, and a 3.3% decrease in burnout. We know that these leaders' behaviors make a difference. They're very simple. They're not rocket science. They're just uh, they're common sense. They're just not common practice. The five behaviors are appreciation. Thank you for a job well done today. Number two, I'm interested in your ideas. What do you think we should do? Let's figure this out collectively. Third is I communicate transparently. Fourth is what do you want to be doing at our organization five years from now? And let's work together to have your career dream come true. And the fifth behavior is inclusion. Everybody in the team, regardless of genome or phenome, background orientation, they all feel welcome, included, and trusted, and included. So uh, those are simple five behaviors. We know they make a difference. Leaders matter. And, and, and so selecting leaders for that and developing leaders for that makes a difference. Here's, here's actually the signature size measure from these five behaviors from uh, one of the years when I was in charge of leadership development at Mayo. And you can see there's a bell curve. And the chairs on the right were doing very well to the eyes of their staff. The ones on the far left needed help. We coached them, we developed them, we did everything we could to move them up and move the whole curve to the right. But if we couldn't move them up, in their performance of those high behaviors, we moved them out because they were hurting patients. So at the end of the day, this basically is my supervisor cares about me as a person. And from Gallup's research across 155 different countries, the number one driver of happiness and engagement and esprit de corps and productivity is if employees in an organization can say this about their supervisor, that he or she cares about me as a person, and that's what those five behaviors are all about. So, at the end of the day, we, if we are really very seriously interested in the best for our patients, the best experience, the best outcomes, the best safety, including lower costs for patients, we need to care about each other for our patients. Thank you. Fantastic, Steve. Uh, wow, what a great presentation. It just, you've kind of left us wanting more uh, uh, because we, uh, we we want to learn more about those principles. I think uh, one of the things that is just so powerful to me, Steve, is your language of measurement and of quality and of the ROI and, and all of it. You could just see where you've applied the science of performance improvement to this vital area, and I, and I can't imagine uh, that you're not going to have enormous global impact and probably couldn't do it without all of the great work you did at Mayo and you did globally in these other areas of quality and leadership and, uh, and in the radiology department. So we'll, we'll, we're going to kind of reintroduce you a little, bit, a little bit later with the Pete Conrad Award, but thank you for a terrific presentation. I want to remind everybody Steve's book will be coming out in the first quarter uh, next year. We hope that you'll come back and give us, the, give us more of the detail. Rather than going to questions right now, since we, we are going to cover briefly the Pete Conrad Global Patient Safety Awards, uh, Steve, we'll come to Q&A in just a minute. And, uh, and so it's now my honor uh, to present Nancy Conrad, uh, the wife of Pete Conrad, the uh, third man to walk on the moon. Uh, Nancy founded the, um, the Conrad Foundation in honor of Pete. Uh, Pete was the third man to walk on the moon. Uh, Pete was a dyslectic child. He actually was uh, uh, flunked out of uh, his 11th grade uh, high school. Someone took them under their wing and understood that he had this learning issue. Uh, he worked very hard. He won a, uh, a scholarship to Princeton. Then he won uh, he, uh, his uh, the, the very prime 
uh, uh, pilot opportunity at aviation in, uh, with uh, uh, the Paxton River um, uh, uh, test pilot program. And Pete Conrad ultimately became the third man to walk on the moon. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, uh, he died the preventable death of a system failure of emergency care. Uh, this is a picture of the team this year of the Innovation Challenge, which Nancy uh, has, uh, undertakes every year. They have a network of more than a million kids around the world that are competing in innovation, and multiple teams come to uh, the Kennedy Space Center uh, as a, uh, a group, and they compete uh, in innovation, and with their innovations that win, uh, they win a intellectual property help, and these kids go on to do really terrific things. Uh, I'm going to play, uh, have uh, Kyle now play uh, Nancy's, some of Nancy's commentary here. Uh, we'll have two, two excerpts. She's on a plane today, and she felt terrible that she was going to miss today, but she didn't want us to wait. So Kyle, would you please play uh, Nancy's uh, statement? Hi, I'm Nancy Conrad, and I had the great good fortune to be married to an amazing man named Pete Conrad. Pete was a naval aviator and an astronaut. He flew full flights in space, Gemini 5, Gemini 11. He commanded Apollo 12 and was the third man to walk on the moon. And then he flew Skylab, which was our first space station. It was damaged at launch. He rescued the lab, and he was awarded a Congressional Space Medal of Honor for that rescue. And during the later years of Pete's life, he worked in aerospace and was working on next generation of space vehicles to take us from California to Italy in 45 minutes. And on July 8th of 1999, Pete took a motorcycle ride with a bunch of his good buddies that he wanted to do for many years. And he had an accident and he ended up in a small community hospital. Pete had spent his whole life and high-performance systems that were built for safety. And unfortunately, he died a preventable death from the system failure. At that time, I got very involved in the patient safety movement, and we created the Pete Conrad Patient Safety Award in his honor. I am very excited with this year's honorees because each of them exemplifies the same amazing characteristics of my late husband, Pete Conrad, and that is passion and dedication and perseverance and grit and doing tremendous work that impacts the future. So we are very, very excited about this year's roster of, of awardees and looking forward to continuing their great work and to honoring the great work they've done in the past as we all go forward on the impact of patient safety. So the Pete Conrad Global Patient Safety Award winners will be announced here uh, briefly. However, we 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 just would not be uh, we would not be giving them justice or the award justice without addressing the prior award winners. And a website uh, it will soon be launched with uh, the examples of the great work of the prior winners as well as the 2018 winners. So the award was established uh, back uh, in 2007. And you see the award winner recipients in 2007, uh, Dr. Don Berwick of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, who Dr. Swenson mentioned earlier, Carolyn Clancy, who at that time was the head of the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, Janet Corrigan, who was the president and CEO of the National Quality Forum, and uh, uh, Peter Angood was representing the Joint Commission uh, on Accreditation, then uh, later named the Joint Commission, and Suzanne Delbanco, who was at that time the Executive Director of the LeapFrog Group, representing the major employers in America. And what this group did, and each of them individually are terrific people, however, they are recipients of the award for their organizations because under their leadership, they agreed to synchronize and harmonize the measures of patient safety at a time when we were receiving a thousand measures that felt like a thousand measures and actually was a thousand measures in a thousand days. And I can remember, and I'm sure Steve, you remember those times. And Steve uh, Swenson was a terrific contributor to the harmonization process with the Mayo Clinic. However, each of these organizations who had their own sets of measures and research and opinions agreed to put their own egos aside and their own programs aside to agree scientifically uh, on the same 
measures and the same standards at that time, the National Quality Forum Safe Practices for specific patient safety areas. And so this article in the Journal of Patient Safety honored them for this harmonization process right down to the individual measures that then could be measured by the LeapFrog group. So this was a case of uh, uh, one for all and all for one working together, recognizing that if they could bring a unified standardized approach together that it would help hospitals, and it did. That brought us to 2012, and Nancy uh, Conrad, who is the one that makes the selections from input from many, many different sources, uh, does not issue this award lightly or even on an annual basis. It's only when there are a group of individuals or a group of organizations that undertake terrific work. In 2012, individuals received the award for their individual contribution and their collective comp contribution at the organization, but this is for their individual efforts. And this was Dr. Jim Bajan, who also was an astronaut who was on two space shuttle flights, who led the Patient Safety Center for the Veterans Administration Hospital, a brilliant engineer, astronaut, physician, who uh, was able to kind of pave the way for us in a very firm and bold way, uh, a brilliant guy to work with, brilliant guy to talk to, uh, and he was a contributor to the National Quality Forum Safe Practices, which I had the honor to chair for years. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Mike Henderson, who's now at the University of Mississippi, was the former chief medical officer, uh, the former uh, uh, chief quality officer for the Cleveland Clinic, and led the charge at the Cleveland Clinic. One of the great examples uh, of the great work they did was they they pulled all 44,000 employees together and got them in small groups, very similar to what Steve had described of getting uh, people working together. And they made the commitment that everybody is a caregiver, right down to the guy who cleans the toilets. I was visiting Dr. Henderson at one time and went to a remote part of the Cleveland Clinic to meet with one of their chairmen and stopped in a bathroom. And there was an elderly man who was the caregiver in the bathroom. And I said, is it really true that each one of you feel like you're caregivers? Uh, and he said, absolutely. And this uh, older gentleman told me, uh, what I do here is being a caregiver, and I'm a caregiver to all of the people that come to the Mayo Clinic. And what better measure than a remote part of the facility with someone that is in a janitor? Uh, David Klassen, one for his individual uh, work on the CPOE flight simulator, the safe practices for uh, infectious disease, and a number of initiatives uh, that, that he has been a contributor to. Uh, and formerly at the Intermountain, Intermountain Healthcare, uh, he is uh, someone that uh, individually made an enormous uh, uh, contribution. And Dr. Steve Swenson, who you've heard today, uh, all you have to do is hear Steve's passion, his authenticity, his intelligence, his application of some of these complex concepts that we can simply uh, uh, implement, and an, an amazing uh, uh, servant leader, an amazing uh, contributor. And he, too, was a contributor to a collaborative effort on the NQF safe practices. And actually, uh, you know, one of the great projects which Dr. Swenson uh, and Dr. Henderson, Dr. Klassen all contributed to was harmonizing uh, the measures for infectious disease diseases and the healthcare uh, acquired infections that occur in hospitals and getting a standardized approach. Dr. David Hunt uh, is a general surgeon. He, he remains to be at the office of the, of the, um, uh, uh, of the uh, National Coordinator of Health IT uh, and was an enormous contributor on the committee of the National Quality Forum Safe Practices, specifically in these areas of infections and, and other areas that were absolutely critical and brought great practical relevance to, to uh, the work. So each of these it were individual award recipients of the, of the, of the uh, Global Patient Safety uh, 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 Program, or uh, I'm sorry, the Peak Conrad Global Patient Safety Award. In 2014, uh, this group of patient advocates, Dan Ford, Arlene Salamandra, who you heard, heard speak, Becky Martins, Jennifer Dingman, Mary Foley, and Patty O'Regan were, were, were honored. Uh, Dan is uh, a, just a relentless champion 
for including patients and families in root cause analysis. Each of these individuals were co-authors of the National Quality Forum State Practices, but more importantly, they each have enormous contributions. Arlene, who you heard speak earlier, uh, has been a, a terrific contributor to uh, the workplace uh, violence and bullying uh, area, constantly bringing this up and helping us keep focused on this area. Also a co-author with, uh, with Dan and, and the rest, uh, Becky Martins, uh, who came to the patient safety movement, as did Arlene and Dan, with because of personal uh, experiences with patient safety. And in Becky's instance, it was her father, uh, and uh, focused on the diagnostic issues. Her affirmations to our, our, our groups in the national webinars have been terrific, as have Jennifer Dingman, who's always been an, an open ear, has an open door to anyone in patient safety, any family that needs help, any researcher that needs help. And each one of them, as Jennifer has, have been contributors on national programs. Uh, Mary Foley is the past president of the American Nursing Association. She's now at UCSF as, uh, and earned her PhD, her doctorate, uh, uh, and is a professor there. Uh, she also has been a contributor to the program, as has Patty O'Regan, who is a nurse practitioner. And they all brought, each, each one of them brought great contributions uh, to, uh, to patient safety before they did what you'll see next is um, this Saturday morning group, the group of meet every other week, which we've met for many years, um, uh, work together uh, to, to develop an evidence-based argument for every one of the hospital-acquired uh, conditions called the HACS. Um, a CMS uh, leader came to me on April 12, uh, 2010, took me aside. He said, I'm, I've left CMS. I want to tell you uh, confidentially that you're, this team of uh, patient advocates were the ones, because of the letters, the campaign that they uh, undertook uh, to impact uh, CMS, got the votes that were necessary to move the, ca the hacks across the goal line. So a recent report now, and this is the gift that keeps giving from these people in patient safety, is that uh, the, the studies now show that uh, the hacks have generated savings of $2.9 billion and about 8,000 lives saved. So this shows the, the greatness of America, how a group uh, of patient advocates that meet informally, that aren't compensated in any way, how they could uh, start a letter writing campaign and uh, uh, my team put together the, the evidence-based arguments for each of the, of the hacks and we find out that, the, that, that their contribution was what carried this across the line. So the ARC report recent, that recently came out addresses, and I won't get into the detail, but we want to congratulate you, Arlene, and uh, Jennifer, and Dan, uh, who are uh, all participants. And so they collectively won the award, but individually are patient safety contributors. So that brings us to our award winners for 2018. We have three individual winners, and we have a team that has won. And uh, the three individuals are Sorel King, the founder of the Josie King Foundation, the author of, uh, she's an author and a patient safety advocate after the loss of her 18-month-old, Sue Sheridan, who has been a relentless champion, both nationally and globally for patient safety after two medical errors uh, that caused tremendous harm to her baby and uh, caused the death of uh, her husband, and Heather Foster, who is a tremendous patient safety champion coming on the scene right now as a national caregiver advocate for caregivers who are having to stand up uh, uh, and speak truth to power in, in, um, in root cause analyses and champion causes like sepsis and, and, and kind of fight the, fight the fight of uh, focusing on uh, caregivers, uh, especially when uh, sometimes the caregivers are made uh, to uh, be taking the blame for systems issues that, uh, that, that may, not, may not even be related to them. So Sorrell King is the founder of the Josie King Foundation. Uh, she founded uh, the, this foundation after the death of her 18-month-old. Uh, we'll never forget the nine-minute video that uh, was generated at an IHI meeting, unbeknownst to her, when we asked her, could this be sent out to hospitals and help raise funds for her foundation. She had no idea that it would have the impact that it did. Uh, a study actually showed that was now will be repeated, shows uh, now that more than 2,000 hospitals are using it with their employees and that, uh, and that many lives have been saved by the use of this 
uh, uh, and her story. So she wrote the book, she has started the foundation, and she continues to be a champion for patient safety. And this was a great opportunity now over a decade of her wonderful work uh, to recognize her. And Nancy is very happy to see that uh, Sorrell continues to be uh, such a champion. And it really tells us that uh, this is a long-term game and uh, Sorrell has, has been that, that long-term champion. Uh, Sue Sheridan, uh, her background is, is just absolutely remarkable. Uh, Sue organized more than 90 mothers regarding Kernicterus and the measurement of bilirubin in newborns. Uh, she was the a force of nature to bring these moms together, uh, met with the Joint Commission, was able to get a sentinel vet through uh, the Joint Commission, has gone on to work with the World Health Organization and patient advocacy. Her terrific work was, was recognized and she became the patient engagement advisor for PCORI, which was the patient, is the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute. She also was appointed a family, uh, patient and family engagement advisor for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. Her young son, who you see there, had uh, serious brain damage uh, from the Kernicterus, uh, and, uh, but has gone on to be a producer, a film producer, and even a comedian. Unfortunately, she lost her husband, uh, uh, Pat, to a misdiagnosis of a cancer, and that leads us to where she is today. And she is, she is leading work at the Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine. Watch the uh, major journals in the next month or two, and you'll see uh, even more impact on this area of misdiagnosis. And so Sue Sheridan, also a published author, she was a contributor to the National Quality Form State Practices, uh, you know, as well, and uh, just could not be a more fitting candidate, uh, according to uh, Nancy, and really, I think, fits the mold of Nancy Conrad, who is just a force of nature. Uh, that brings us to our third individual winner, which is, uh, who is uh, Heather Foster. Heather is a Colorado nurse who has championed the cause uh, in her own community uh, for patient safety and quality after the death of a patient uh, and uh, has worked with a family member uh, after that event uh, and is, I think, a rising star of uh, patient safety uh, and will We'll probably see a lot more of Heather uh, leading initiatives nationally to help caregivers uh, uh, step up uh, and uh, speak truth to power in, our, in the root cause analysis process, engaging patients and families, which is a passion of Dan uh, Ford's, and uh, be a vigilant champion for uh, the caregivers that are on the front line. And, and uh, really neat to see Nancy pick uh, someone like Heather Foster, who is a rising star uh, in that area, who's still fighting that good fight. And then the finally, uh, and uh, after um, uh, the MedTAC team, and we've presented numerous times the MedTAC uh, uh, approach, uh, and I'll advance the slide to slide, to slide 82, uh, of uh, the pre-hospital uh, care, bystander care for cardiac arrest, choking and drowning, opioid overdose, anaphylaxis, major trauma, and with a high, with a and tremendous focus on severe bleeding, common accidents, transportation accidents, workplace violence and bullying. Uh, uh, this has been presented a, a, n a number of times. Uh, uh, the team was asked to present at the NASA uh, Space Center in, in um, uh, the Kennedy Space Center uh, to Nancy Conrad's uh, uh, group, and as a result, uh, uh, she has uh, selected this team as the team award for uh, patient safety, and it includes uh, Dr. Greg Boats, who we'll hear from in just a few minutes, uh, Chief Bill uh, at MD Anderson, also an adjunct faculty at Stanford uh, uh, University at Medi Medical School, uh, Chief uh, Bill Adcox, who is uh, the Chief of Police of the University of Texas, uh, Health Science Center repre representing the care for 20,000 individuals and the safety of them in the, at the medical center. Uh, Mr. David Bashk, who's a middle school educator, one of the greatest educators I've ever had the experience and honor of working with, uh, who is uh, also a med tech trainer for our, the school uh, initiatives. Uh, Mr. Perry Bechtel, who is a, uh, who is a, a um, university student, a freshman, who took the MedTech program that was started at Stanford University and has been able to deploy it at the University of Florida and starting a regular process of that, an Eagle Scout, as is 
Mr. David Besh, who is uh, leading the scout programs, and Charlie Denham, who uh, is uh, a seventh, incoming seventh grader, and uh, I have the honor of uh, being his dad, and uh, who start, was the co-founder of the program uh, about two and a half years ago when uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Boats challenged uh, us to think about active shooter events and uh, why it was such an important issue. Uh, and uh, uh, Chief Bill Adcox then led us to uh, experts that said, listen, there's a lot more going on than active shooter events at schools. There are many lives that are lost. And that led uh, the, the research team to identify the eight uh, leading causes of death that the MedTAC program is, fo is focused on. So we're very, very pleased to have uh, these award winners uh, and as we start our survey, and then we'll uh, have our reactions to uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Swinson's presentation, we'd like to have the survey up, Kyle, and uh, we have two questions uh, regarding burnout. Uh, we will ask the question uh, of you, would you like more information on caregiver burnout? And if you do, what specific topics would you like? That will be the first question that will be up on the survey. And the second is, what are the new patient safety issues that, keep, that are keeping you up at night? And if they are, what are they so that in our future webinars we can address them? And so first off, I'll have Kyle take us uh, to Dan Ford, who could not be here today but wanted to comment on, uh, on uh, the, the Pete Conrad Award. And then uh, we will go to Dr. Swenson to have him react. And then we'll go through Dr. Boats and uh, Chief Adcox uh, and then Arlene Salamandra. So please play uh, Dan's uh, comments. Chuck, thank you for um, asking me. I have known Sorrell and Sue for a number of years. They're a couple of the really passion, passionate patient advocate and patient safety pioneers. You, you've talked about the tragedies that their families respectively have experienced, and they didn't sit, sit around and feel sorry for themselves. They decided to take a positive route and to cause constructive change, made the decision to do that, and they've done that in various ways. Heather, I've gotten to know over the last uh, couple of years, and she is very, very strong, passionate uh, advocate for uh, caregivers championing uh, the parallel side of the whole medical error scenario uh, with caregivers. Uh, she's championed also the root cause analysis, the deep dive into the root cause analysis, and to uh, inviting the patient family to participate in that. The MedTAC team has just done wonderful work over the last two and a half years in terms of school and church and scouting and law enforcement and uh, various caregiver programs in bystander care, and I applaud each of the members of that team for their continued work there. Thank you, Chuck, for asking me. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dan. Steve, we'll, uh, we'll go to you uh, just to react to the, uh, the award piece, and then we'll go to uh, our other reactors so we can talk about burnout and, uh, uh, and the other thoughts. Steve? I just in awe of the work that these people have done for patients tirelessly and selfishly and and uh, Chuck and the, the whole team involved with this it's a wonderful service for us to see these role models and and get the inspiration from their patient and family centered work thank you Thanks, Steve. Uh, uh, Greg, uh, do you want to react to the burnout? And again, congratulations, uh, Greg. If it hadn't been for your 15-minute call about something that you had great passion for, which were the active shooter events, there would be no MedTech program. And we will always be so grateful to you for being the champion of that and the care huddle checklist and so many things that we could thank you for, but we need more minutes to do it. Well, thanks, Chuck. Thanks very much. Uh, it's indeed a an honor and a privilege to work with this group on MedTech and to be recognized by the Nancy Conrad, the Conrad Foundation for Patient Safety is just a tremendous honor. Um, I started my journey in patient safety, as many did, looking at how we can improve the system of care delivery to make it safer for our patients. But it became apparent to me, as it has to many of you, that in order to provide a safe environment for our patients, we have to have attention to the safety and well-being of our caregivers. And to hear Steve Swenson talk today about burnout 
and the esprit de corps that needs to be reinfused in our healthcare system is is so meaningful. It's right on on target with the things that we want to do in order to make our healthcare system better for our for our patients. And I guess uh, what I would say in closing is that. Uh, Steve, I'm going to strive to make my signature as small as I can over the next year. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. I love it. Well, well, I'd like to uh, now ask uh, Chief Adcox uh, to to uh, to react. And, uh, you know, as I was listening to you, Steve, and listening to what the great leaders were like and what they did, I've had the real honor of seeing Chief Adcox perform like that and to be that kind of a leader. And I think he inspires us daily with it. So, uh, uh, you know, I think, uh, uh, you know, I could put faces to some of the things you've described, Steve, in your fab fabulous presentation. Chief. Well, thank you very much, and, and Chuck, as usual, you're, you're too kind. Uh, I would like to comment a little bit on, on Steve's uh, presentation because I thought it was phenomenal. Um, one of the things that stood out was the issue about you can't give what you don't have, and I think it's, it's very critical to think of, of the caretaker. If you're not safe in, uh, yourself as a caretaker, I don't see how you can provide you know, patient safety at the highest levels. So the truth is, you can't give what you don't have, and if you're not if you're not sound and healthy, and you're burned out, it's going to be very problematic. So, thank you for such a great presentation, and look forward to much more. But uh, on behalf of uh, our MedTech team, the you know University of Texas Indiana National Cancer Center, and the University Police Department, University of Texas Police Department, uh, I am so honored and, and privileged uh, to be part of the team uh, that's receiving the. Um, the team award for the P. Conrad Patient Safety Excellence Award. Um, you know, really, our team is dedicated to preventing deaths. You know, by by sharing knowledge and um, providing training opportunities. You know, for 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 bystanders, for for non-medical persons, so that they can provide immediate life-saving care uh, for for those eight preventable death scenarios. And it's something that's very near and dear to all of our hearts. And and you know, I'm so humbled to be part of such a, a great team. And uh, MedTech is, is just too critical, too important. And I, I do want to thank and appreciate Nancy uh, Conrad and the P. Conrad uh, Foundation for all the important and critical work they do. And the, the, the mere fact that they're, they're really recognizing this team that I play such a very small, minuscule part to is, is, is very appreciative and uh, look forward to working and furthering the cause uh, as time goes by. But again, thank you very much. Great, great. And the great thing is we have some time to come back, Steve, to some of the other topics, which I'll do. I'll, I'll bring back uh, our slide, but I'd like to allow Arlene Salamandro to comment on what she uh, heard and also congratulate you again, Arlene. You know, the great, who would have ever thought that the submission of all the letters and the attachments with the evidence for the hacks would have pulled them over the, over the goal line with such a small team and a help desk. But uh, Arlene, without your steady, vigilant, uh, uh, focus on it with the rest of the team, with Dan and 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 Becky and 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 the rest. This it wouldn't have happened. And just imagine eight thousand eight thousand lives saved and uh, billions of dollars. So uh, Arlene, your comments and and I know uh, Heather Foster. We weren't sure she would be able to come on. She's one of the other award winners. I'll I'll go to Heather uh, perhaps to get her comment if we can get her on the line. But uh, Arlene, go ahead. Um, yes, I'm so humbled by what you were saying, Dr. Dunham, about our our uh, role in getting the happy task. And I think it just shows that when you have a good team and everybody works hard and they're passionate and, and they believe in the cause, I think a lot of mountains can be moved. And um, I just want to comment on Dr. Swenson's presentation. Like I mentioned earlier, I was a, a uh, working in healthcare in a nursing home facility for 11 years in a non-clinical clinical position, but yet I felt in the beginning I was part of a good team, and um, we all worked together, and the results were good. Our patients were happy, um, and we had good outcomes, and leadership changes, and I think when you get the wrong leaders in, it does affect the whole, the whole organization, and little by little, um, that, that team work is torn down. So I think it's so important to have good leadership and include everyone and give everyone that value 
uh, that they're working there, maybe not in the medical field, but they have value towards the care of their patients. And I would like to congratulate everybody for uh, winning the award now uh, and Nancy Conrad for being uh, such a strong patient advocate. And um, it's just, it's heartfelt to, to see people that worked uh, so long and hard uh, to get some recognition. So I, I, I'm really happy for the award winners. Thank well, you. Thanks, Arlene. And Heather, we're just so uh, so honored to have you uh, uh, be uh, with us today, and uh, it was exciting to see that Nancy Conrad uh, selected you as a, a Pete Conrad Global Patient Safety Award winner for your steadfast and 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 singular courage in this area of patient safety and and working with families, and and we just want to thank you for uh, your effort and uh, and to keep uh, fighting the good fight. Uh, do, you, do you have anything you'd like to say? Well, I'm humbled by the nomination. Um, most nurses, uh, they we're just doing our job. And to be nominated for such a prestigious award, I'm speechless. And thank you, Pete Conrad Foundation and Nancy Conrad, for your steadfast um, passion in, in making sure or trying to implement a way that this doesn't happen to the next patient or the next caretaker. Um, thank you. Well, great, uh, Heather. Uh, we're we're uh, we're looking for great things for your your national advocacy, and I think you've got a great uh, great group that will help support you. Uh, Steve, uh, I'd like to have uh, you uh, go back to. I'm putting back up slide 56, and can you, since we have a few minutes, can you give us some of the highlights of the er other areas that uh, you'll cover in your book? And, uh, and give us a, a little bit more takeaway. You've got our mouths watered now, and you've got us so excited about the work you're doing. We'd love to hear a little bit more. Sure, uh, Chuck, thank you. So um, how about down in the bottom right side, there's a fancy word called commensality. Commensality is a fancy word for sharing a meal with someone. And the, the original research was done in uh, firefighters, and then at Mayo Clinic, uh, Colin West and Lottie Derby and our research team there did two randomized controlled trials with doctors. And here's what we found. We found that if um, doctors or nurses or uh, managers took time um, twice a month to have a meal with each other and talked about what was your best patient story, what was your best time with the team uh, at our organization, um, and the other group, the control group, just uh, went out with their work and didn't have that uh, connection. There was a huge difference in social isolation and cynicism and positive feelings about the organization. So it was so powerful that we started funding uh, meals for any healthcare professionals, professionals that wanted to get together and just talk about the joy of work and caring for uh, patients and families, and it, it, it was a, it's a very, it's one of the few things that actually costs money in this uh, opportunities to build the esprit de corps, uh, other than time and attention of leaders, but just getting together to share a meal and talk about um, uh, life as a professional. Human beings are social animals, and we need to have some time with each other to connect us to the meaning and purpose of our, of our work. Um, what else? Um, can, can you so, address the co-creation of boundarylessness? Yeah. So the, the, the we have so many boundaries in our organizations and life. So there are boundaries between nurses and doctors and social workers. That's a kind of the uh, the power distance index. And and so if you look at causes of burnout, they're different for doctors and nurses. The primary causes of burnout for nurses relate to compassion fatigue and moral distress and lack of psychological safety, um, lack of physical safety gets in there also. Um, and much of that work environment is the result of either leaders that are not effective, close to the patient, or frankly, the way that doctors interact with patients. So boundarylessness is taking the boundaries between professions the boundaries between roles, 
the boundaries between inpatient, outpatient nursing homes, the boundaries between cardiology and cardiac surgery, and saying we want to build social capital. So social capital is the trust and interconnectedness of the people in an organization. It's probably the most powerful leading indicator of organizational um, effectiveness is, is if the people, the doctors, the managers, the nurses, the uh, social workers trust each other and are they connected. Um, quick stories, we, we, you know, Robert Rice, former labor secretary, goes into organizations and he, to assess the vitality and the, um, and the well-being of the organization, he just listens. He listens for the pronouns that people use. And in organizations where the doctors, nurses, social workers, and managers talk about we and us as opposed to they and them, the ones that talk about we and us and our organization are set up for success. And the ones that see this boundary between administration and them are the ones where there's a lot of work that needs to be done to build trust. Uh, which is one of the basic human needs that we have is to need to be trusted at, at work and in life. And, and so that pronoun test is a good indicator of an opportunity to break down boundaries and feel like we're part of this organization and we're not just an employee and, and we uh, are empowered to make the care better for patients. Chief Adcox, are you there? Uh, yes, Chuck. No, I think I think the boundary list, which you just talked about, uh, was very very profound because I think when we're looking at the hospitals, and from my experience, is when you when we create silos, a lot of times that's that's made for protections of whether it's patient information or privacy or other issues. It does it does become we become a little bit overprotective, and we we begin to build our own little silos and organizations, and quite frankly. It, it reduces that, that 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 part that you talked about, is that socialization and and uh, how to be human and, and how do you use the different uh, walks of life and the different professions and and, the, and uh, to help each other. So you're 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 really correct, and I'm glad that we asked about the boundary list. And I'm going to be doing a little bit more research on that myself because I do think that that's that's very important, along with the other nine uh, points that you brought up. And Steve, could, um, can you, can you, I, I am absolutely fascinated by the correlations with the measurable clinical impact. Uh, can you, can you give us a little bit more about the wound healing and the clinical outcomes that can be directly correlated with the, this area that you're working in? This was absolutely just fascinating uh, to hear. And I mean, I, I think this is, for those that think that this is touchy-feely and soft and all the rest, it becomes pretty hard when you tar start talking about clinical outcomes and uh, error rates and harm rates and we can put, uh, you know, we can kind of ratchet right down on some specifics. Can you, can you give us a little bit more on the clinical impact of Esprit de Corps? Yes. So, you know, this, this is social science and it's sociology and it's cultural anthropology, but it's real science. It's people science. And, and if you look at the delivery of healthcare, at the center of it is the how people work together. It's a team sport, and and so we have to um, work together as a team with the right relationship, and then have the right relationship with patients and their families. So, so empathy is one of the first things that goes with um, professional burnout, and and so empathy can help actually protect us in another virtuous cycle because if you share empathy and are empathetic with the patient, then they're back at you as uh, to protect you. And patients who experience empathy, um, like I said, are more likely to have their wounds heal faster or just fascinating, but they're also more likely to um, be involved with their care plan in an active way. And and so there's a really interesting study in health, uh, health affairs a couple of years ago that showed that when patients felt their care team cared for them and loved them and had empathy, they were much more likely to follow through on filling, filling prescriptions and with their care plan, and, and they had better results physically for their condition, and it cost them less money, the patients. 
Um, and, and so there's there's a cost savings for the patient and the community and the families, as well as institutions, when there's this supportive, trusting, empathetic relationship between the doctors and nurses and the care team and the patients, uh, because that's what, um, if, you, if, if you really have conversations with a lot of the people that we care for, uh, it's they want to, that's what matters to them as much as finding out what's the matter. Great. Well, so so if we look at an organization, Stephen, I'll, I'll come back to uh, our Arlene and and if Heather's still on to to comment and 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 uh, um, uh, and and if Dr. Boats comes back on. But uh, specifically, if we have institutions, which we do, that are saying, "Okay, this sounds great, Steve." What are the diagnostic tools that might be used to kind of know what their is state of esprit de corps is? And then what kind of simple initiatives of getting started might they consider? And maybe the third thing, and I don't want to load you up with too many questions, but if they wanted to get their bosses to be exposed to this, to kind of think about some of the, some of the pilot approaches or just to get to think this way, you know, what might they do? So three things. Are there diagnostic tools for esprit de corps that you can recommend or will they be coming? Number two is once you have your diagnostics, small projects or projects that you could get started to get your feet wet. And the third thing is how do you how do you sell it to the boss? So let's start with that um, third um, how do you sell it to the boss question. What we don't relative to that Forbes article and what we know, you don't want a headline. Um, so sadly too much of the patient safety and quality movement started with headlines of high visibility deaths or preventable errors, including the, the Pete Conrad story. So you don't want a headline, but, but many of the organizations in this country that have uh, well-funded, robust well-being programs started with a resident suicide, a nurse suicide, a physician suicide, and physician suicide rates um, twice the general population. For women, it's 2.3 times higher than um, women outside of the medical profession. Uh, similar high rates for nurses as well. And, and so, so I think it's better to not start with a headline, but if you have a, have a crisis and the headline, use it. Instead, start with the heart. Get a story about um, the, how a superior functioning team works well um, and and then connect it to the business case. There's a rock solid business case. The literature is robust on this, particularly if you tie it in with some of the practice efficiency and the quality work. This pays for itself. So healthcare is late to the party here. If you look at um, all the other major business se sectors in this country, they have looked at employee engagement, which is a subset of esprit de corps for decades because they know it makes them money with lower rates of turnover and higher rates of productivity and more organizational citizenship behavior, which is the discretionary effort. So there's a, there's a business case, but start with a story that, um, that, that will get them engaged and then come in with the, the business case. The, the, and then sometimes the way to start is with the, your, your first question, well, what do you, how do you measure this? So sometimes you just get permission, say, can we measure burnout? Can we measure esprit de corps? And, and all the major vendors um, that, that do uh, uh, staff surveys will have questions related to burnout, related to engagement, fulfillment, satisfaction, and so on. Uh, so measure that in an all staff survey and then see where the benchmarks are. And that may be enough to get the senior leadership on board, or maybe it's the nursing turnover rate. The average nursing turnover rate is 14.5% in this country. That's a serious safety issue for hospitals, and it's a serious financial issue for hospitals to have that rate of turnover. And, and so if you work on burnout, you work on esprit de corps, those turnover rates go down, it saves you money, and it saves lives. Um, so I would start with a, a national benchmark. You just All you need is a a dozen questions um, from one of the major vendors, and then use that to uh, make people uncomfortable with the current situation. Half the doctors and nurses are burned out. Well, we need to fix that. And then 
um, commit to an annual measurement. If you don't measure it, then you're not paying attention to it. And I, I, I would start with removing pebbles and, and co-creating quality and asking the unit by unit what Dr. Martha Lacey did. What, what um, are your frustrations? What doesn't work well in hematology? And let's fix what we can and communicate what we can't. And, uh, and you can flip numbers within a year. You can have huge improvements in esprit de corps and low rates of burnout just by uh, improving workflow and practice and efficiency and team dynamics. Great. So we have what I'm going to remind everybody, we just have a few more minutes. We have a, a Q&A uh, section in the lower right, right quadrant of your WebEx field. If you have any questions you'd like to ask uh, Dr. Swinson, please enter them there. Uh, uh, we have one question. I'll go back to uh, Arlene for any comments and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Boats, if he's on. Uh, and uh, Chief Adcox. But the one question that came in over the transom here, Steve, are there any national collaboratives like what have been run by IHI? Uh, we understand that you are a fellow there and that kind of thing. Are there any collaboratives that uh, hospitals or healthcare institutions could join that are focusing on applying these 10 actions? So, yes, yeah, so, um, IHI, a group of us wrote a white paper that's free and accessible on IHI.org on joy and work, which is the, the original wording that uh, Dr. Edwards Deming used 15 years ago. And so the joy and work white paper basically summarizes what we, uh, is the removing pebbles piece and, and co-creating uh, quality. Um, and, and they have had a, a large collaborative and they will have more. Uh, I think um, so. IHI would be a good, you know, great. It's a great not-for-profit organization that, that would be worth checking into for uh, those opportunities. The um, Stanford has a program uh, that that, uh, that um, you can check on the website, their website, for getting engaged in and in uh, ideas. Fantastic, Charlene. Did you have any comments or questions to Dr. Swenson? Yes, uh, he mentioned employee surveys, and uh, employees are given surveys just about every year. And unless you have the good leadership to look at those surveys objectively and take action on some of the concerns, you can take surveys every year and your organization won't change at all. So I think action, you know, find out what's going on, and then action and then change. Maybe there are some leaders in there that do not fit the overall um, um, idea of what your organization should look like. And um, so action is very important after you uh, question uh, the employees. You, you know, you're absolutely right. So it's critical. I, I think there are two critical things. First is that you, you survey staff regularly, and annual is a good place to start. And you have meaningful data down to the unit level and to that unit leader level, because leaders make a difference and measuring the morale and esprit de corps and the burnout at the unit level is, is an important message. And then you only ask questions that you are absolutely committed to improving. And, and then if you do, and the, and the workers, the doctors, nurses, social workers, see that you care and you follow through, then they'll fill out the survey next year and you can see things get in the right direction. And, but it has to be a regular measurement and you have to be serious about improving esprit de corps. Heather, would you like to make a comment on what you've heard from Dr. Swenson, and then we'll go back to Arlene to close. Well, Chuck, I'm truly excited hearing that there are collaboratives out there. Um, I think what's important is having leaders who really care and want to make a difference. Uh, we can dish out surveys to caretakers till the cows come home, but until you have an engaged leadership who are truly not only there to pick up a paycheck, but that want to make a difference, that see, that see and recognize that this does matter, this does affect the care of our patients, um, I don't think you'll see a change um, um, unless you have leaders who are engaged. Absolutely. Could not have been said better. Absolutely. So, Steve, uh, I'd just like to thank you so much for uh, just a tremendous uh, presentation really opened the doors of our minds to the potential impact of what this uh, can have clinically, operationally, financially. Can't wait to see your book. We really would love to have you come back and cover the other topics. And again, Steve, thank you for your 
steadfast contribution to patient safety, a former uh, Pete Conrad Global Safety uh, Award winner. And we want to thank Nancy, who uh, will be on again with us, who was uh, unfortunately on a flight, but for her passion and uh, the way that she has just stuck with this issue from the time that she lost Pete where, when I met her just after the accident. And uh, I was working with NASA on commercializing uh, technologies. Uh, she has been relentless on the issue of uh, a patient safety and quality. And we just want to thank Nancy, although she's not with us today, we want to thank her for, uh, again, bringing the award. Uh, she only does it occasionally. It's not every year. And uh, it, it was su such an honor to have her do it uh, for us this year. Arlene, would you like to close us? And uh, we'll look forward to our webinar next, uh, next month. And if the speakers could stay on for a quick uh, performance uh, Im Im improvement loop. So uh, Arlene, would you please close us? Well, I want to thank everyone for taking the time to be here uh, for the webina webinar. Uh, I know I learned a lot and, and very hopeful for a good future. Um, so if you could share this, if somebody couldn't be on today, uh, share this information. It's on the website. And like Dr. Swenson said, go out there and care about each other and uh, have a good week. Thank you. God bless.